Okay. Well, I, I can never tell because uh, as far as um, when the, when it's ready for me to record, the, I'm so used to Zoom saying this recording has begun. I don't have that right now. Anyway, so uh, one of the things I wanted to do, and I the one last thing I did uh, in regards to Warren Moses work, um, I read off a uh, a thing he uh, he did uh, on Real Progressives, which I'm hoping to hear uh, uh, pretty soon be able to work with them on a, a wide range of uh of projects um anyway uh he responded to someone i forget who it was but uh the coppola i think a lot, uh, the last name was you can check it out it's um right now it's uh currently um the first video you see on my on my youtube channel um anyway i, do, I don't know if that did uh if i'm if my reading of that did much justice for what uh, he was trying to say in regards to uh, the f fundamentals of uh, MMT. Uh, in this case, um, I, I saw that he has a framework and analysis for price level and inflation. Now, this is a long uh, and detailed uh, piece of work here. Um, so, and I'm trying to do no more than 15 minutes, you know, to kind of keep, keep myself. Um, on a time on timey fashion as far as the park goes so if i get to a certain time then uh i'm going to obviously tell you guys to uh to check it out on his uh, website um mosler i believe mosler economics or no yeah mosler economics uh dot com anyway uh framework for our analysis of the price level and inflation this was uh done last year uh, introduction. The purpose of this chapter is to present a framework for an analysis of the price level and inflation. Modern monetary theory is currently the only school of economic thought that in, in direct contrast to other schools of thought specifically identifies and models both the source at the price of the price and level and the dynamics behind changes in the price level with MMT offering a unique understanding of inflation as ac uh, academically defined as part of its general framework for analysis that applies to all currency regimes. I was asked to do a chapter on inflation under the textbook definition, which is a continuous increase in price level. However, under close examination, this turns out to be elusive at best. At any point in time, the price level is presumably both static and quantitative, uh, quantitatively undefinable. That's why even the most uh, sophisticated central bank research uses abstractions, the, mo that the most familiar being the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, which uh, went up, uh, one, like, I think, 1.8% uh, as of today, as far as the bar goes. Anyway. Uh, CPI was consists of selected goods and services designed to reflect a cost of living rather than the price level, nor can central banks determine a continuous rate of change of, his, uh, abstract, of this abstraction. They can only tell you how the CPI has changed in the past and they can attempt to forecast future changes. Even worse, they assume the source of the price level to be entirely historic derived from an infinite re uh, regression into the past that, in theory, pred predates the birth of the universe. One, the MMT money story. The MMT, the MMT money story presumes a state that desires to provision itself via monetary system sequence as follows. Uh, imposition of co coercive tax liabilities, state spending, Payment of taxes and purchase of state securities. Again, with more, uh, with a more extended narrative, uh, the state imposes tax liabilities with penalties for non-payment. The state, uh, the tax the credit required for the payment of taxes are units of the state's currency issued only by the state. The state liabilities, by design, create sellers of goods and services seeking the appropriate tax credits in exchange, the latter being, def uh, by definition, being unemployment. 
The state then provisions itself by spending its currency to purchase the goods and services it desires. Taxes can then be paid, and if offered for sale by the state, state securities can then be purchased. I should I should be mentioning the numbers here. Number five, state spending in excess of state receipts remains outstanding as the net financial assets in the economy that fulfill savings desires underused to pay taxes. Number two, the MMT Micro Foundation, the currency as a public monopoly. The MMT money story begins with the imposition of coercive tax liabilities to create a notion demand for that currency. That notion demand is the sum of units of the currency needed to pay taxes and the, and fund resident uh, residual savings desires, as evidenced by what is uh, offered for sale by agents seeking that currency in exchange for the, their goods and services. With today's state currencies, for example, the non-government sectors offer goods and services for sales or sale until they have satisfied their need to pay taxes and their desire to net save. The state monetary system is a public monopoly with the state the sole supplier of that which it requires for the payment of taxes. The state therefore necessarily dictate, uh, dictates for terms of exchange when spending to purchase goods and services with the quantity quantity that it can buy uh, inversely related to the prices prices it pays. For example, if a tax liability uh, tax liabilities are 100 and savings desires are $20 and the state offers to pay $1 per day for labor, the state will be able to obtain 120 days of labor. If instead the state pays two, uh, $2 per day for labor, it will obtain only 60 days of labor. If both examples, uh, in both examples, rather, the government, the non-government sectors are selling labor at the state's price to the point where agents of those sectors have sufficient funds to comply with their tax liabilities and the net save as desired. For a given, for a given fixed nominal tax liability and savings desire, when paying higher prices, the state both site redef redefines the value of the currency downward and purchases less in real terms. Therefore, the state can, as a matter of arithmetic, when paying higher prices, only buy more real goods and services by increasing tax liability or through increased savings desired. That is to return to the prior example where tax liabilities were 100 and savings desires 20 and the labor wage was increased from $1 per day to $2 per day, and a tax increase to 200 or an increase of savings de desire. Savings desires to 140 uh, would result in the state obtaining the same 120 day, 20 days of, of labor as a received with $1 wage. And the U.S. tax liabilities tend to increase as the U.S. government pays higher price due to federal, state, and local transactions, taxes that are based on prices. These includes income taxes where higher nominal incomes result in higher tax liabilities and sales, uh, sales taxes where higher prices also result in higher tax liability. Additionally, savings desires are based on a real, uh, real rather than nominal uh, consideration. Retirement savings desire, for example, are based on the presum presumed cost of li uh, living during uh, retire uh, cost of living during retirement years. There we go, or otherwise known as the golden years, I guess you can say. As prices rise, those nominal savings desires rise accordingly. Business business liquid, uh, liquidity needs and inventory and receivables financing needs also rise as prices arise. Therefore, in addition, in general, an economy experiencing a continuous increase in price requires a continuous nominal increase in what is casually called the money supply that constitute constitutes 
the economy's net savings of financial assets. Without this increase, without this increase, real savings desires cannot be achieved as then evidenced by unemployment and excess capacity in general. This, in fact, is my narrative for the 1979 recession. Fiscal balance tightened as tax liabilities increased faster than government uh, spending and the real public debt growth further uh, decelerated due to the increases in the, the price level with the combination driving the economy into a severe recession. Number three, the source of the price level. With the state the sole uh, with the state the sole supplier of which it demands for payment of taxes, the economy needs the state's currency and therefore state spending sets the terms of exchange. The price level is a function uh, of prices by paid by the state when it when it spends. There are two primary dynamics involved in the determination of the price level. The first is the introduction of an absolute value of the state's uh, numerator, uh, which takes place by the prices the state pays when it spends. Moreover, the only information with regard to absolute value as measured in units of the state's currency is the information transmitted by state spending. Therefore, uh, all nominal prices can necessarily be traced back to prices the state pays when spending its currency. The second dynamic is the transmission of this information by markets allocating, allocating by price as they express in different levels between buyers and sellers and all in the context of the state's institutional structure. The price level, therefore, consists of price di dictated by government spending policy, along with other, uh, with all other prices subsequently derived by market prices, operating within government institutional structure. Uh, this will be number four: agents of the state. The U.S. Congress has designated agents to work on its behalf. These include the Federal Reserve Bank, which operates the monetary system commercial bank members of the Federal Reserve System that are federally re re regulated and supervised, and the U.S. Treasury, which evacuates, or I'm sorry, <laughs> executes um, purchases and sales as directed by legislation by instruct instructing the Federal Reserve Bank to debit or credit appropriate accounts. Commercial bank Fed, may, uh, Fed members have demand uh, accounts at demand accounts at the Fed call reserve accounts. Federal tax liabilities are discharged by either the payment of, of Federal Reserve notes or cash or by the Fed debiting a member bank reserve account and it is, and if it is a bank client initiating the payment by the member bank simultaneously debiting the bank account of the client making the payment. Non-bank entities can only make payments to the Fed indirectly through a Fed member bank as a correspondent or by using cash. Members as an agent of the government likewise influence the price level as bank lending supports client borrowing to spend on goods and services. Government regulation and supervision controls the prices paid with funds borrowed from the commercial banks. And with the unlimited liquidity inherent in a floating exchange rate policy without regulation, banks could lend without limit and without collateral requirements or other means of control, controlling the prices paid by borrowers, which could quickly impair the government's ability to provision itself and catastrophically, catastrophically, uh, catastrophically there we go, devalue the, current, the currency. Number five, the determination of the price level. The state sets the terms of exchange for its currency with the prices it pays when it spends and not per se by the quantity of currency that it spends. For example, if the state has an open-ended offer to hire soldiers at 50,000 per year, the price level as thereby defined will remain constant regardless of how many soldiers are hired and regardless of the state's total spending. The state has set the value of its uh, numerator, uh, don't, know, don't know how I can actually pronounce that, 
uh, exo -gen generously, um, providing the information of absolute value that market forces then utilize the utilize to allocate by price with exchange of values of other goods and services determined in the marketplace. Without the state uh, supplied information, however, there would be no expression of relative value in terms of that currency. Should the state decide, for example, to increase the price it pays for its soldiers to 55000 a year, it would be redefining the value of its currency downward and increasing the general price level by 10% as the market forces reflect that increase in the normal course of allocation allocating by price and determining what relative value. As for as long as the state continues to pay soldiers 55000 per year, assuming constant relative values, the price level will remain unchanged. Uh, and for example, the state would have to continually increase the rate of pay by 10% annually to support a continuous annual increase of the price level of 10%. Inflation dynamics, number six. I begin with an academic de definition of the, of the rate of inflation. In quotes, if you're listening, uh, the continuous increase in the term structure of prices based by economic agents today for purchases and sales for future delivery dates. This can also be referred to as forward pricing and it's uh, an ex expression of the policy rate of the interest determined by central bank policy. MMT makes a distinction between changes over time of the price level versus the rate of inflation, which is expressed by the current term structure of the prices. Of prices, excuse me. The price level changes with prices paid by the state when it spends our fiscal policy, while changes in the term structure of policy interest rates or monetary policy. After the term structure of prices and while the term structure of prices does not a forecast of changes in the price level, that is not to say it doesn't influence the future direction of the price level. Interest rate policy also functions as a fiscal transfer as the state is a net payer of interest to the other, to the other sectors of the economy. With public debt levels in excess of 100% of GDP, for example, a 1% rate hike ultimately adds interest income payments of over 1% of the GDP to the economy. This increases or uh, this increase in state spending directly increases nominal incomes and to the extent agents receiving the interest payment increase their spending state interest for pay, uh, payments support sales output and employment state interest expenses also reduces the fiscal space as it partially says partially satisfies the need to pay taxes into net and the and to net save that is created by state tax liabilities which means there will be that many fewer goods and services offered for sale to comply with the remaining tax liabilities. This means the state's real purchases of power, um, and power, excuse me, well, that too, actually, but no, uh, purchases of goods and services are reduced by interest payments as per the same framework for analysis uh, discussed in the previous examples. Therefore, as described above, I conclude that the state's payment of interest implemented by the state to slow the rate of growth and work to counter price increases is far more like to the reverse. Uh, also of note is that interest payments are necessarily necessarily to those who already have money and are, are also paid proportionally to the amount of money one has. In prior publications, I have leveled a positive interest rate policy basic income for those who already have money, which then, which when stated as such, has no political support whatsoever. Yet as a monetary policy that, presu that, that presumably flights inflation or fights inflation, central bank rates increases received widespread support. To summarize, I see interest rate policy as both backwards and confused. First, the rate of inflation academically defined is an expression of the central bank policy rates. So rate hikes directly increase that measure of inflation. Second, a third of me, the payment of funds, uh, a third for me, uh, the payment of funds only 
to those who already have money as a cure for what is believed is inflation does not serve public purpose. Uh, interest rates and wages. An increase of the central bank's policy uh, rate in the first instance increases state deficit spending and total income in the economy. This means wages are then a smaller percentage of total income, which to some degree, depending on per, uh, pro propensities, to spend implies that the relative value of wages has decreased. This further implies that if wages are indexed to the general price level in the context of a positive policy interest rate, an increase in the wage will cause a larger increase in the general price level, which will then trigger a higher wage in the accelerating spiral. However, in the context of a zero policy rate, a wage increase would not be magnified by this process. What I'm suggesting is that this combination of wage indexation and high payoff policy rates of interest selectively observed in nations experiencing undesired increases in the price level ironically contribute to accelerating rate of increase the interest rate policy is meant to curtail or contain, excuse me, the hierarchy of demand. Okay, I don't think I'm good then. Uh, demand uh, origin, originates with the state. Without state spending, the value of the currency is unspecified and there, and there is no aggregate demand. Only subsequent to state spending can the currency obtain absolute value and non-government spending take place. Conclusion, this chapter provides a, a framework for the analysis of the price level in inflation. The framework is that of the currency itself as a public monopoly with the state settling or setting, excuse me, nominal demand with a tax uh, with its tax liabilities, as well as providing the tax credits to allow compliance with those tax liabilities. This understanding entirely explains the source of the absolute nominal value price level uh, over time. Also uh, implied is the role of interest rates with regards to the academic definition of inflation and the influence of public rates on a market de uh, determined expression of relative value. Okay. Well, I just wanted to put a uh, more of a detailed um, a detailed piece of work up there that Warren Moser has put out. Uh, obviously, that was from last year. Um, and I think, and I, that kind of explains what uh, I'm a big fan of Mike Norman as well. Uh, PitbullEconomics.com, uh, I believe. Um, he has said over the past few weeks that um, interest rates are uh, a fiscal expansion, meaning that because majority of the, a lot of the, uh, the government, um, departments, Social Security, and other places like that uh, hold uh, U.S. Uh, government securities, meaning that when interest rates go up, that actually expands payments to those same programs, apparently. Um, you can look this up yourself as well. But um, th those interest rates, uh, it seems, could be a bump or a boost for Social Security recipients like myself, We'll have to find out how it goes next year as far as that part goes. But anyway, my point being is uh, everything that you basically hear on, on the news financially, you might want to think about doing the opposite uh, because a lot of times those people are, they don't really know what they're, ta they're talking about. Um but if you've made money off, if you have been, if you have made money based on those suggestions, by all means keep going. But at the same time, kind of take caution with uh, what they are doing as far as the part goes. Majority of the people who, um, not 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 including myself in, in this case, but majority of people who um, teach and um, who talk about M MMT. Uh, have extensive backgrounds in financial uh, in the financial industry. Warren Moser himself um, worked on Wall Street, uh, was even um, manager of a bank. Uh, so he knows the in and outs of the, the Federal Reserve. Um, and he's also given advice uh, to Federal Reserve and other countries in regards to whether they, whether they will go whether, whether they will 
for, be forced to default on, on their currency or not. Uh, so he has a ton of experience with that. I mean, that's the reason why he, he brought this on. He basically, um, what do you call it? Um, architected this, I guess. I don't know. Uh, founded MMT in, in regards to modern monetary theory. Stephanie Kelton, she was a, as Stephanie Bell was in college, uh, when she heard about him and, and his method, she 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 tried to come up with a paper to dispute everything he said, and she couldn't. So uh, Mike Norman himself, he's, he's worked on, he's worked on the floor of Wall Street, he's worked in trade, uh, uh, he's he's worked with traders and all the stock stocks, bonds, and other things like that. So these these people are literally you know, they, they are the cream of the crop as far as finance the finan financial world um anyway uh follow all of them if you if you want uh to learn more about mmt um also uh pick up uh, the macroeconomic book that uh that has a uh, l randall ray on it um and other people um it's I, I I've 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 had it on this channel before anyway um and and the uh, the 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 job guarantee book that that was flashing up here and before anyway let's see but just to make sure I'll go right here uh, this is what I'm referring to right here you check that out uh and. Yeah, hold on. And uh, so check this out too. If you want to learn uh, macro, if you want to learn macroeconomics, check this one out. Check out the previous book and other books of that nature. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. In this case, thanks for listening as well. Uh, this will be on my YouTube channel later on. Uh, I'm going to be doing something for my Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash just Calvin learning MMT or hashtag MMT, I think I put it. Um, also, uh, Calvin Taylor dot Substack. I'll be putting something up as well there. Either way, uh, thanks for watching, listening. Hope you learned something. Um, yeah, follow, follow those that I have mentioned and uh, follow me as well. Peace out for now.